I uh, wrote about 10 icons of evolution in my book. I could have written about more, but I had to stop somewhere. And the 10 that I wrote about uh, were, first of all, the 1953 Miller-Urey experiment that purported to show that uh, life could have begun spontaneously on the early Earth. And this is still found in most biology textbooks, even though geochemists decades ago decided that the experiment was unrealistic and really doesn't say anything substantial about the origin of life. This is the story of a small planet in space called Earth. For a typical Darwinian explanation of how life originated, Dr. Wells directed me toward this documentary. The chemical elements essential for life, hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, were now in place. What was needed was a way of combining them. Perhaps the energy came from lightning. Whatever it was. Excuse me? Whatever it was, energy managed to arrange these chemical ingredients in just the right way. Whatever it was? I was hoping for something a little more scientific. The most popular idea has been that life emerged spontaneously from primordial soup. In 1953, Stanley Miller mixed water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen to simulate the early Earth's atmosphere. Then he ran electricity through it in an attempt to jumpstart life. It didn't work. While the initial results seemed promising, 50 years later, most serious scientists have abandoned this approach in favor of alternate theories. Prominent Darwinist Michael Roos attempted to explain one of them to me. He wasn't kidding. How did we get from an inorganic world to the world of the cell? Well, one popular theory is that it might have started off on the backs of crystals. My crystal ball molecules piggybacked on the back of crystals forming and that this led to more and more complex. But of course, the nice thing about crystals is every now and then you get mistakes, mutations, and that this opens the way for natural selection. But, but at one point there was not a living thing. Yeah. And then there was a living thing. How did that happen? Well, this is the, I've just told you. And I don't see any reason why you shouldn't go from very simple to more and more complex to more and more I complex. I don't either. I don't either. But I don't know how you get from mud to a living cell. That's my question. Yes. Well, I've told you. I think it's on the backs of crystals. Try one more time. On the backs of crystals. On the backs of crystals is at least one hypothesis. Yes. So, so that's your theory, and you think that is more likely and less far-fetched than intelligent design? I think it is. I wouldn't put Ben Stein's money on Dr. Roos's joyriding crystals. But it did make me wonder, what were the chances of life arising on its own? It's been speculated that probably there would have to be a minimum of about 250 proteins to provide a minimal life function. Um, if that's really true, uh, then I think it's, it's almost inconceivable that life could have happened in some simple step-by-step -step way. How much money have you ever gotten from Jerry Falwell? Uh, zero dollars. How about Pat Robertson? Zero. Are you a minister? No. Are you a priest? No. Pastor? No. Youth pastor? No. <laughs> I did teach Sunday school once. <laughs> Has this all been resolved? I mean, aren't we all Darwinists now? Except for a few cranks like you? Well, it's a funny thing that questions that aren't properly answered don't go away. This, this question is, is loaded with all kinds of political baggage, but one-on-one -on -one at a scientific meeting after the third or fourth beer, my experience has been that many evolutionary biologists will say, yeah, this theory's got a lot of problems. We're talking about something that's staggeringly improbable, roughly one in a trillion, 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 trillion. Let all of life choose a million, a trillion, a trillion, trillion. The number is z essentially zero. Something has to skew nature to choose the ones that work. So in the game of life, it looks as if the house always wins. Luckily, some serious scientific minds have figured out a way to beat the odds. Directed panspermia. When faced with the overwhelming problem of the origin of life, Nobel Prize winner Francis Crick proposed this theory, that life was seeded on Earth, which basically means 
aliens did it. Crystals? Aliens? I thought we were talking about science, not science fiction. We don't know what caused life to arise. Was it, did it arise by a purely undirected process? Or did it arise by some kind of intelligent guidance or design? And the rules of science are, are being applied to actually foreclose one of the possible, one of the two possible answers to that very fundamental and basic and important question. So the rules of science say we will consider any possibility except one that is guided. Exactly. No matter how life began, on the backs of crystals or in the test tube of some intelligent designer, everyone agrees it started with a single cell. But what is a cell? Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Darwin wrote uh, The Origin of Species in 1859, published it in 1859. He had an idea of the cell as being quite simple, correct? Yeah, everybody did. Yeah, okay. If, if he thought of the cell as being a Buick, what is the cell now in terms of its complexity by comparison? A galaxy. If Darwin thought a cell was, say, a mud hut, what do we now know that a cell is? More complicated than uh, a Saturn V. So what is in a cell as far as we know now? A world that Darwin never could have imagined. The cell really is like nothing we've ever seen in the physical world. That's got to be firmly grasped. That's, that's, that's not something we can just say, oh, well, it's just a little bit more of the same old, same old. It's not the same old, same old. What we are finding is that there's information that's in the cell that cannot be accounted for in terms of these undirected material causes. So there's, it has to and, be. And so there's, there's yeah. some, some other, so there has to be an information source. So one of the key questions faced by modern biology is, where do you get information from? Well, uh, Darwin assumed that the increase in information comes from natural selection. But natural selection reduces genetic information. And we know this from all the genetic population studies that we have. And where is the new genetic information going to come from? Well, that's the big question. So when we find information in the DNA molecule, the most likely explanation is that it too had an intelligent source. I mean, we need engineering principles to understand these systems, OK? I mean, it's only because of our advancements in nanotechnology that we can even begin to appreciate these systems. But using intelligent design didn't seem to stop the scientists I spoke with. So why all the controversy? Suppose we find, simply as a matter of fact, that our scientific inquiries point in one direction. Which is that there is an intelligent creator. Why should we eliminate that from discussion? Streng verboten? How come? Why? Streng verboten. Very good. What does streng verboten mean? Strongly forbidden. Strongly forbidden. You've got two possible hypotheses. You've got a wall through the middle of your, through your brain, in effect, through your thinking, you say, well, you can't consider anything on this side of the wall. Only hypotheses on this side of the wall are permissible for consideration. What about academic freedom? I mean, can't we just talk about this? They, their reply is that science is not a democratic process. Oh, really? And that there is a consensus view but wait and a minute, that we but, are to subscribe to well, the wait consensus a second, But view. Darwin challenged the consensus view, and that's how we got Darwinism. If Darwin wanted to challenge the consensus today, how would he do it? Science isn't a hobby for rich aristocrats anymore. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. And if you want a piece of the pie, you've got to be a good comrade.